good afternoon. A bit of a, uh, a long title uh, adapted for this uh, session, let's say. Um, I have a, a broad background. I did philosophy in uh, uh, Ghent, Venice, and also Saudi Arabia. So I asked the uh, chat GPT to make a composition here uh, <laughs> of those uh, three places, which might not have been that much of a success. Uh, so I did also research on cancer um, and it takes mining, machine learning in Saudi Arabia. So now I'm working in the botanic garden of, uh, of NASIM. So we have different kind of collections. And we have also different European projects that uh, the team needs, Clinton, um, was able to uh, secure. The need is to get um, data tubes for biodiversity analysis, um, which might also be uh, interesting for digital twins and things like this, actually. Tetris is to secure more uh, taxonomists to get the observations, which is also really important to get the data to do the models with. And, and I'm working here on, on Garden. Um, so Garden stands for Safeguarding Biodiversity and Critical Ecosystem Services Across Sectors and Scales. The main lead is India in, in France, and they have this uh, uh, PlantNet website. I don't know how many of you are familiar with it. It's mainly for uh, plant uh, observations. Um, my task in, in this European project is uh, to see um, how I'm able to use species interaction data to improve um, the predictions from species uh, distribution models. Um, so the session is beyond prediction, so I was kind of just reflecting, you know, okay, tech, new ecological insights, that's how I guess we want to go beyond, um, and then it's kind of going beyond, or equals beyond correlations, and I guess that's especially when we want to understand things causally, so we've already kind of discussed it today, uh, how do we establish causal relationships. For me personally, I, I also think a lot about the time, the time involvement, you, you want to see something happening at time point zero and then be able to validate that at a, at a later time point if it really was a causal factor and if you were able um, to control it. But you don't always have that luxury of having that. For the garden project we also plan on using uh, climate scenarios and then those to see what the, the uh, impact would be. Um, but going beyond, well, correlations, this is maybe not really going beyond, but I really like this paper that came out this year um, on species issues and models may predict accurately future distribution, but probably how distributions change. So they try to at least improve the validation, and they make the point that a lot of the work that is going on is kind of do static validation. They use most of, of the data before a certain time point and then just see is it still predicting actually at this last time point, but because of um, spatial temporal autocorrelations, those models seem to be performing well. Um, but they don't really predict when things will change that well. So they, they kind of propose um, having a way of validating um, the change. And they also have a section on kind of species traits. So this kind of thing also inspired for me a little bit to, to think about how I might use species interactions. Uh, species interactions, from one point you could see that maybe as a species traits. There's a kind of um, an aggregation of all species traits data set, and the one that I'm using, Brody, is actually um, listed as a data set there. Of course, interactions are kind of determined more by the traits that the species have. Will that make it likely that they will interact in an ecosystem, and will that have um, consequences? So interactions you have on the species codependence, it might be positive or negative correlations in certain habitats. Um, but certain of these well, interactions will kind of have causal effects. Uh, the easy example is of course uh, uh, predator uh, and, and uh, prey. So uh, global biotic interactions, that's kind of an aggregation of all knowledge that we have about uh, interactions coming from uh, different uh, data sets, so you can find it here on global interactions of work. Um, I work with this data set, I, I filter it, so the, the people that submit data, they, um, they should in theory specify exactly which species, it doesn't need to be at species level, it can also be taxon level, and uh, other taxon levels, family, genus, whatever, um, and they're supposed to 
to also annotate what value they're actually using. So I filter away all data that doesn't do this, and then I aggregate it for the same type of interactions between same species, of course. And there's also sets on um, refuted interactions. They kind of keep that to maintain the history of how this data sets are uh, evolving. Um, in my local network, I just uh, remove them. And I do add the, the relationships between the species genus family um, to the network to get more connections. But we'll get into this um, later. Um, so the original data set has around three million and a half, uh, but yeah, after filtering, uh, I only ended up with 200,000. Uh, relationships 15 million, I ended up with 12 million. This is probably also the aggregation uh, that's, that's happening here, we end up with 200,000. There's originally 271 data sets in Loom at this point, and I ended up with 265. And so for each interaction, there should be publication. So there's a five million and a half and after filtering I have four million, four million seven hundred. Um, in Garden there's also um, a, a kind of competition going on with a uh, mainly uh, French uh, observation and data set. Um, they have a baseline model which is a, a random forest. We already heard several times that random forest seems to be uh, having good, good performance. Um, they have that there as a baseline model, so um, other research institutions can just submit uh, their models, might be any kind of neural network model also uh, to outperform this kind of baseline. So I'm working to see how I can use species interactions to improve this, um, and so I'm not making species decision models myself at this point, I'm just using their baseline model at this initial stage. So let's go now to the network analysis. Um, this is kind of just showing how the SDMs are actually uh, performing. So I, I just, uh, the data set is really not that, that big. There's a, a good 2082 species there. Uh, so they sent me all the training models. Uh, as a few of them were broken. Uh, so I'm, uh, the results I'm presenting here is just 2014 species. Um, and then it's kind of showing uh, the occurrences. So the maximum one species has 1,654 occurrences. Um, now in the, uh, the model, the training model, um, just have like, well, this guess the same species that then just at least has one place where it's predicting 91% uh, uh, that it should be present there. Uh, but if you look like the first 25% only have two occurrences in the, in the training uh, data. And then of course, they, you know, it's always safer than to say that it's never there. So uh, the training models for a lot of the species will just basically say that they're, they're nowhere um, to be seen. So again, I didn't work on the models. They're just the baseline model for the scanning, but I'm now actually working with, with the predictions and seeing if we can still get something um, out of it incorporating it with species interactions. So this is all the interactions so for all those 2,000 species. I then got them from my local global network. Um, and you can see, so it's, in two, it's only 10 data. And you can see it's very interesting. We have most things are just saying interacts with, which basically is kind of associates with. So sometimes when they make an observation, it could be associated with, so that could be competing for the same resources, but it doesn't really sound that, that interesting. It has host, that, that already sounds a lot more interesting. Um, how we would apply for this um, tag only data we will see later. Uh, eats, of course, uh, you could have insects um, eating. At this point, interactions might still relate some, to some species that, that are not uh, in the analysis that we're going to go ahead with now. Uh, so, um, only had 4,700 of the species. I have interaction data in this global set, a total of 5,000 unique interactions. Um, I take uh, some inspiration also from social network analysis papers that I have been uh, reading the, the, the last one. So if you do want to do a network analysis, you can look at indicators like uh, density, uh, but you can also, from a node, you can have the in and out degree, that's how many hours connections or incoming connections they have between us, the centrality kind of metrics. 
But what I would now present is doing a, a very tiny subgraph analysis. So a diet and a triad, kind of a small snap of analysis you can do, you just take uh, for a diet two nodes that are connected and for a triad uh, three nodes that are connected and either they're um, all connected to each other or, or there's one um, open connection. Uh, with network analysis you can also make embeddings and that's also something that I'm uh, working with. So for the dyadic analysis, what we now see here is we have those different types of interaction. Um, and every time in the, in the network we have connection, I then get all the predictions across all the sites um, and see how well are they correlated. So um, these are all the species in the sets that are interacting, that they have an interact with relationship, and then we kind of see um, how well are their predictions correlating for hexological curves. Of course, I'm from the same set, I then make random diets to have a, a random a comparison. So here we kind of see the, the random model. Um, I think it looks nice with the violent plot because then you, you can see that there, there is notable kind of difference, especially even just with this interaction, although it doesn't sound that um, interesting compared to the random one. You do seem to have um, higher um, correlations of their predictions compared to just randomly looking um, at the bands in the network. Um, but if you then kind of try and visualize this, so these visualize visualizations are coming from this Planet website, so it's actually not exactly the same data. This is one of the highest correlated, so based on their predictions. We have here Silidum radialum and then Pratinus picnocephalus. Uh, okay, so apparently this is how a positive interaction diet would look like. And if you now look at a negative one, I mean, for me, there's not, this is the, 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 the highest negative correlation, not that much uh, difference. Yes, so for me, not really that much difference. I did also um, look at, these are when they are occurring together, this is when none of them is occurring, and this is when only one of them is occurring. So I then made um, a metric out of this called the correlation checks. And if we now um, arrange this in correlation quantiles, we see that the ones that are really highly correlated, they, they also have uh, a lower value of this correlation check. So uh, something seems to uh, uh, be correctly in the data, let's say. If we now have a look at the uh, triadic, so this is the open ones. We see this interaction, it's very um, interesting. Uh, kind of binomial thing going on, we have interacts with co -occurses. So basically we have three nodes and this is just a set. So this one could be twice interacts with one time co -occurses. This is, um, sorry, it's the open triadic, so it's two times interacts with, this is interacts with co -occurses. it has codes. This is how it looks like again, compared to a random model, there seems to be something interesting. Of course, I'm not taking just the average, but of absolute value, because there might be negative correlations or positive ones in both are actually interesting. Um, these are now closed ones when really three species are connected together, three times interactive or uh, three times as host. Um, and here compared to um, random, didn't have any other closed triads available, a total volume of um, 84. But again, uh, a very strong binomial kind of distribution. And there's only one observation of the has host, and I'll actually um, pay a little attention to this one, because it's kind of interesting. How would they, they be hosts of each other? Um, they might be <laughs> strongly correlated, but there's no reason why they're really uh, hosts of each other. And that's because the data that it's coming from is EDNA, where they are taking a sample of all the leaves, and apparently they find this other plant um, available there. Um, and then they just annotate it as has hosts, which is clearly uh, not the case. So that's the kind of data um, I have to work with, unfortunately. Um, strategies to improve predictions, so we could use predictions of node species network specificity or generate network like embeddings. Um, I actually also did some PCA on all the predictions and then see if I can fit this in uh, together with um, embeddings of the network um, and see if I'm able to increase the performance uh, together actually with the original uh, species prediction. And here I'm kind of uh, presenting um, either the species embedding in its network and the PCA conclusion we have true, negative, positive, and so um, on. 
Um, this is trying to improve the predictions with individual species predictions and, and species embeddings. Here we have it with uh, also the PCA and all predictions and um, here everything together, which seems to have a, a slightly better people. Uh, Curry steps, uh, still a lot of work to do on the species embeddings. Um, add to make annotations to the interaction network to make the network uh, better um, and get better, better embeddings and maybe even better predictions. All the code is here, actually, the code for this presentation, you can find it here. Um, thanks for your attention and also the team uh, at the Thank you. section that I kind of had to run over uh, just now, right? Um, yes, so I make an embedding and then I use it to, to train also a random forest model together with the original predictions. So the embedding within the interactions within like the within, species Within the network. So the network that I was able to get for all the species, I use that, that network to make all the embeddings for the species with, and then I see if I can use this knowledge of where the species is in the network to improve the predictions. But it might be just kind of remembering or getting kind of a barcode for the species and then, you know, um, just on the per species level, having kind of a trust for how well was that original prediction, will I trust it, yes or no, to, uh, to still claim that it's a prediction. So I'm basically reusing the original proof sets to train again the model. But it's very recent work, so there's still some things. Thank you. Any other question? Uh, you uh, had uh, the, the category co occurs with. Uh, if you apply that uh, to plants, that would allow you to, to integrate the entire knowledge of uh, what is uh, usually classically called plant sociology. Uh, to, to what extent actually you incorporate that? Well, yeah, so, and I, and I couldn't go into the detail, but the co-occurs bit was interesting because it was actually slightly negatively correlating the ones that were annotated in the network as co-occurs bit. Uh, the interacts bit, which I personally think is more a proxy for co-occurs bit, had those kind of positive correlations. Um, and, and then we had the has host, which was kind of faulty data, but it was eDNA, so there's physical evidence that they were co-occurring. So um, I don't know if that goes in the direction of plant sociology, but I do think for plants, this is almost the only useful thing we have to try and use that information. Um, if you include other animals, insects, then yeah. Well, there, there, there is abundant uh, data on uh, uh, plants that uh, co-occur with each other, grouped uh, and uh, different types of plant assemblages characterize and, and name, uh, and that, that would be an extremely huge uh, data set that is uh, available, um, and that uh, probably would, would be interesting uh, to focus on certain types of, of environment uh, for, for a more integrated automatic evaluation. Yeah, that sounds perfect. What's the name of the... <laughs> The name of the data set. Plant sociology. Ah, this is a that is the, ah, this is the, okay, ah, this is the discipline, okay. That, that gathers uh, yeah. plant assemblages and uh, develops typologies of yes. plant assemblages. Yes. I would think that it should be in this Globy data set, basically. It, it should have been there. Thank you. Thank you so much again. Okay.